Hey this is Sayyam Botani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science a podcast for data science enthusiasts where i interview practitioners researchers and calculators about their journey experience and talk all things about data science Hello and welcome to another episode of CTDS Talk Show. In this episode, I interview Lavanya Shukla, who is the head of growth at Weights and Biases. Lavanya has had a very interesting journey into machine learning and into programming, broadly speaking. We talk all about how she started programming at the age of ten, uh, built amazing websites through a dial-up connection in India, and over the years improved her skills. Eventually. joining a computer science pro- degree program and dropping out of it and finding her way her passion for machine learning we also talk a lot about general advices on how should you progress your on how you should progress in your programming and machine learning journey broadly speaking i think the advices apply really well to both of these points Lavan is also as i mentioned the head of growth at bits and biases and we talk all about bits and biases the features currently supported by uh, zend reported to track machine learning experiments and what can come out of it so if you're excited about all of these topics without further ado here's the conversation please enjoy the show Hi everyone. Uh, usually we drink chai on the show, but today Lavanya is joining me with uh, unfortunately a cup of coffee. Thank you so much, Lavanya, still for joining me on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Cheers. Uh, so I am having my midnight uh, green chai. Cheers. Uh, I want to start by talking about. Uh, usually we start by talking about my hero's uh, machine learning journey, but I think you have a very interesting programming uh, journey as well. you you mentioned you started programming at the age of 10 can you can you share that story uh, how did you get started and about uh, that yeah sure uh, so i grew up in india and um when i was 10 i was obsessed with harry potter um and uh i couldn't find a lot of harry potter fans uh, around me in india so um i would go to these websites like mugglenet was a big one and talk to people um and i was like oh if these people can build this I can also build a website because if I build a website, I'll have all these friends to talk to about Harry Potter. So initially, it was a very static, like HTML uh, website with tables and stuff. Uh, we didn't even have a lot of CSS back then, um, and found it really exciting. But then the aha moment was when I saw other people's websites had uh, like polls in PHP, and like mm. they would like do fun things, and it's like. Oh, mine is just static. Let me figure out how to do that, and started uh, doing PHP, which, uh, looking back, is like, oh my god, one of the most ridiculous languages. Uh, but um, it was such like a coming to Jesus moment. Like you know, when you um, the first time I wrote my first line of code, I was like, oh my god, this is so cool. The world makes sense. Like I could see everything in the world could be. Exp- pressed as like functions and classes and objects and that was just like so exciting um and then from there um the website was pretty popular um and then i had to like forget hosting and that made me get into server management cuz i was like oh what are these server things that i'm paying for um and then i remember the first time i uh, had my own vps and i logged in and i restarted it or did stuff on it and it was hosted all the way in atlanta here uh and oh, i was wow. like oh my god you know like from india i'm sitting in like uh making stuff happen in a server in mm. the us that's cool so that was yeah and just, just to remind the audience this wasn't around the time when i think we had these convenient digital ocean one click setup everything no this is uh, back in 2000 two ish yeah okay how, yeah. 
how did you figure out uh, all of these things? Because usually, at least, uh, I, I may be passing on a bias, but in India, we don't have that strong uh, nerdy culture where you do these side projects in in school. True. So my parents, I think, are really amazing because, like, uh, they're both. They have the same job. They're very smart, and like it, most people in India, like your smartness is what you're like considered like it, that's your self-worth is tied to how smart you are and so we were very encouraged to try different things and that's just the thing that I latched on to and it was also like I couldn't help it the moment I started coding I was like oh my god I need more of this and I would wake up at 3 a.m in the morning because wow. my uh, yeah because my friend was in Denmark uh, and uh, you know I would just wake up at 3 a.m in the morning before school and code and my mom was like, oh, my God, this girl is crazy. But like, then I was doing cool stuff. So she was like, all right, I'll let her do it, I guess. Yeah. That's awesome. So uh, t- talk us through how, how did you progress through that uh, coding through the dialogue connections, I think, back in the day uh, to today. How, how did you progress in your uh, programming journey? Uh, so uh, after that, um, after the whole server management thing, I tried to do a few startups, uh, which all failed, sadly. Uh, I Like everyone else at the time, I was trying to provide hosting to people. And um, uh, that was around the time I went to Purdue um, in Indiana. Uh, and when I moved to the US, it was quite interesting because um, the Indian viewers will know that the way we learn in India is very different. It's very rote and it's more about yeah. the theory. Um, never like that hated theory you know i just wanted to code and like when i went to purdue i studied computer science there their approach was interesting because like it was all about they throw you into the practical parts of coding and that makes it more exciting because like you know you're not you don't have to earn your way into being able to code by learning a bunch of theory you just do it um and then you figure stuff out so uh uh, studied computer science at Purdue for some time, gained a different perspective on programming. And then I kind of uh, dropped out because I wanted to do a startup. And that's what all of my idols, like, you know, and like so cliche, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, that's what they had done. So I was like, of course, I'm going to do that. Uh, my parents were not super happy about that. Um, and so then I moved to New York initially because uh, at this point, uh, I was trying to forget who I was. Uh, I wanted to have a life beyond just programming as well because I'd been such a nerdy kid. So I did a fashion tech startup first. Um, quickly got bored of that because it, it wasn't intellectually exciting, at least for me. Um, and then moved to SF to do a proper startup. Um, and the startup that I tried to do was um, build my own operating system that was okay. kind of uh, yeah, don't do that. Don't start a startup <laughs> to build an operating system. Uh, and I still think there was merit to the idea. I still haven't seen that startup played out properly. Um, but the idea was right now in operating systems, everything is organized by the type of the file. So all images are in one place and photos. Um, all your docs are in Google Docs or whatever, or like pages. Uh, but I wanted an operating system where it's organized by people and topics. So mm-hmm. if you're hanging out, right, uh, I log into my computer, I click on your name, and it pulls everything uh, from every other places. So like the images, the web pages, everything that's common to us. And then that's the space we're living in while we're interacting. Or if I click on like something that I'm interested in, like machine learning, it shows me all the papers and all the people in my life. Like, you know, so the data types are different and like it's based on how people think about life rather than how computers find it easy to organize information so the uh, the i guess the file system is sort of a mind map uh of... yeah uh yeah it's like a mind map and like the connections are pretty important which that notion doesn't exist right now hmm. i guess and oh, okay. do you so I'm I'm always fascinated by the Bay Area culture. Uh, did, did, were you always drawn to that? Because I guess you were secretly preparing for it. You you started co- coding at a young age. You had this business mindset. Then you also dropped out of your degree, which uh, pretty much checks all of the boxes, I think. Uh, I guess I feel like uh, I look at the world as a buffet um, instead of like 
uh, like you know you're uh, born someplace so that's who you are because like, even everyone who's born around you is so different um and I feel like I was just like naturally always a good fit for that kind of people my friends were always very nerdy um even some of my best friends today are like just like you know we get in um to conversations we grab a bottle of wine and we talk about like you know the universe physics like there's certain topics that attract people and that kind of person ends up in bay area somehow and the people are really nice in the bay area too they really want to do something that's bigger than themselves um mm-hmm. Yes, there are some egos, but mostly it's about like making a difference and people actually mean it. And that also I found cool. Uh, I'm, I'm also curious about uh, the discomfort of resistance. Was, was there any, because uh, even even when you're uh, teaching yourself at a young age, especially there's, there's, uh, there's challenges with that, but also dropping out of college. Uh, uh, how did you find the courage uh, to navigate through that? Uh, yeah, so I think... It was made easier by the fact that a lot of my friends had also dropped out and they took it as a badge of honor instead Mm. of... So to give you context, my brother, um, my little brother followed a very traditional Indian path. Uh, He graduated, did really well and is younger than me, but is uh, finished his MBA from Cambridge. So that kind of... And like he could never fathom like dropping out and like, you know... uh, and like that culture, the culture that he lives in, his friends would never accept someone who dropped out uh, as an intellectual equal. But in the Bay Area, if you drop out, it's like, oh, you're contrarian, you know, because it's all about contrarian, uh, contrarian thinking. So it just made it easier to have people like that. How, uh, and this this is also a question for people who are listening into machine learning. We'll get to that. But uh, many people are new to coding. They're, they're trying to learn uh, how would you, uh, if you were to advise yourself, start that journey today? Or how, how did you progress through it? Uh, any any uh, key highlights for you? Great question. Uh, don't be scared. Uh, and I'm actually going to give practical advice, not just like, but uh, it's like people who are doing this, even at the top levels, are not any smarter than you are, are not any more hardworking than you are. They're exactly the same as you all your heroes um, are the same as you and started out exactly where you are. Uh, so you're in the right place. Now, um, it is a lot of hard work you have to commit to like making coding your life for the first few years, at least. Can't have a social life, can't go out partying. And I know that's not a glamorous life, but it actually, uh, it's like exciting in its own way and very satisfying in its own way just to sit in a field and like spend a few years becoming really good at it. The other thing that I think uh, is very important is to start doing like working on actual projects the sooner that you can. Uh, and I know like there's a uh, like, you know, you might be like, oh, I need to earn my way to being able to do stuff because I don't know anything. So I should learn more theory and more mm-hmm. theory. And the trap, especially with machine learning uh, too, that you can get down is like, uh, okay, I need to know linear algebra, I need to know calculus, I need to know stats, I need to know this and this. And then a lot of people will be like, oh, should I be coding uh, linear regressions from scratch, SVMs from scratch, decision trees from scratch, which is great. But then you have to be mindful of the kind of machine learning engineer you want to be. Uh, I also, I actually like the faster approach of learning. The top-down uh, approach. Better. Exactly. Because then you start to get the ice cream uh, at the beginning and then mm. you get more and more committed. What what projects uh, would you recommend? Because uh, they, they, there are many interesting dimensions. Many people would like to start with Python. Uh, do you have any general advices there? Yeah, uh, yeah, actually this is something I feel very passionately about. And now that we're hiring, like I am on the other side, um, the things that we look for are People like everyone who's gone through Coursera and Udacity has done those endless blah 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 projects, which is great, and you have to do them when you're trying to understand things. But find something that if if you are hiring someone, right, and you see something so out of the box um, mm. that you haven't seen before, that's going to make you be like, oh, this person's creative, they're driven, they found a problem that other people haven't, and you know, went from like 
um, maybe actually find a problem that you're interested in and then collect the data set. This is specifically for machine learning, but uh, actually collect the data set, actually uh, build, uh, write some wrangling scripts to put the data set in a form that it makes sense to put in the model, then try a bunch of different models and then create a nice analysis, tune the hyperparameters, do that whole thing. And to give you more context, so the project that I did um, was, uh, I was super into physics and this was, uh, I like uh, I'd gotten into machine learning at this point, um, but um, I had taken a break from my startup because it wasn't working out. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm just gonna dedicate six months to hmm. just machine learning. And I was also into physics and one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't study physics, uh, which is <laughs> shared by a lot of uh, people uh, like us. Um, so I taught myself what the standard model of physics is um, and then uh, found this data set of, uh, uh, from CERN, uh, which actually, um, had, uh, so CERN has this large Hadron Collider, which has a lot of different like uh, detectors uh, and the data set essentially um, has these different particles. So uh, CERN will, uh, sorry, this is getting into too much detail, maybe stop me if I am. No, no, it's, it's I, I, I remember uh, you've also given a talk, which uh, I, I found really fascinating. So I'll have that in the show notes as well, uh, but oh, it, it was very fascinating for me to find, find out about that. Oh, thank you. Uh, it, it's a really fascinating problem because see, uh, like once you've learned like your basic SVMs and uh, decision trees, neural networks, blah, 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 you could apply it to a lot of different problems. Why not apply it to like uh, detecting particles in the Large Hadron Collider? That's as exciting a problem as any that I can think of. Um, so I found this data set um, and what they do at CERN is uh, they take uh, two nucleuses and they accelerate them super fast and ram them into each other. And when they collide, a bunch of subparticles uh, come out and then they start um, like, you know, going through uh, the accelerator and at different points in the accelerator, there are different detectors that catch different frequencies. Um, and this data set actually is pretty, a pretty straightforward classification problem. Uh, so the machine learning part for the first part wasn't as hard. So I was able to spend more time uh, on the physics part. Um, and then the first classification model was pretty simple. I think I did an XGBoost uh, one and also trained a neural network. The XGBoost got better performance, which does okay. happen. <laughs> so <laughs> don't uh, discount the boosting models. Um, then it got exciting because the second problem was uh, you have this data set of um, electromagnetic showers and you're trying to detect what could potentially be dark matter. Again, we don't know if dark matter exists, what it actually mm. looks like, but given what we do know, these signals could potentially predict dark matter, which is a very exciting thing to put on your resume. Yeah. So that's in, like, you know, I spend, that was a lot more machine learning because you had to do classification, then clustering, blah, 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 chain a few models together. Um, and uh, that was, um, I, I, that project helped me uh, get talks. So like GDG was like, oh, you should come give a talk. This is cool. Um, and then at this point, nobody knew me. Uh, and like, uh, you know, I was just some person doing machine learning. But because the project was exciting, even though I didn't have that much experience, people were willing to be like, come give a talk. And then uh, how I landed our current job is like, um, I had uh, a, like, uh, when we were doing our previous startup, I had known my uh, CEO through that, but my, like uh, not that well. And then um, he saw uh, on Twitter, my tweet about one of these projects. And he was like, oh, that looks cool. Let's get coffee. And uh, we got not coffee. <laughs> I, I know, right? <laughs> uh, dude, we need to introduce the people in the Bay Area to chai. It's pretty cool. Um, I was going to visit and do that, but uh, my plans got cancelled. <laughs> oh, yeah, the time soon. I'm sure you'll get a chance to do that next year. I, it's, it's my mission. It's my absolute mission. <laughs> we should hang out and introduce people to try. Uh, so uh, then, um, like, he was so excited by this one project. Again, I didn't have that much experience with machine learning. Our other colleagues, like, she's uh, she went to Stanford. Like, you know, she worked at Flickr in the machine learning team. But just that project allowed me to cut through a bunch of red tape and get this job. Uh, yeah. So that. Do, do you uh, do you think uh, 
people usually uh, they try to replicate interesting projects uh, uh, how, how should they find these creative ideas uh, and uh, mm-hmm. i i think it's it's also an interesting way because uh, i i think you mentioned you didn't learn physics but maybe you found out all of these details while building the project was that the case yeah yeah totally uh how, yeah go ahead so how, how do how should one find these creative ideas uh, or should should they just uh, go go on uh, an extended idea just trying to experiment and see if, if that works do you recommend that mm-hmm. approach interesting uh i would say like you know if you're at the point where you have somehow taught yourself machine learning you're a pretty smart and curious person in general so give yourself permission to chase those curiosities you know uh another thing that i deeply believe in and i think uh in a lot of asian cultures not just in in culture and a little bit in parts uh, of the us culture like again you have to earn your way to do the fun stuff and that yeah. is so not true like like if i ever have kids i'm going to let them get to the ice cream at the beginning cuz that gets you hooked but like how that applies here is like we all have these things that we find so exciting that if we started doing we would not be able to help ourselves but just spend hours doing and find something that overlaps with machine learning and find a data set um and then you won't be able to help yourself you'll find new ideas better <laughs> than most people because you probably are a subject matter expert even if you're not you probably are more driven than other people working on that problem and you know and then just apply machine learning to it I think it's it's also fascinating. Like like you mentioned, uh, many people don't realize this. Uh, the courses are marketed in a way that they make you feel uh, you don't know something. So maybe you'd like to go back to learning machine learning, SVM, uh, random forest, anything. Instead, you could just uh, hack your way around uh, building these ideas as well and figure it out along the way. So has that been your experience? Uh, so i i did go to college uh, i bunked all my classes and that's what i did <laughs> love it uh see we would be friends if you came to the bay area and you would love my friends cuz they all did that too um i i would say yeah definitely um all you need to know uh honestly is whatever it takes to get the project out the door and especially when you get a real world job but you're never going to have all the context you're never going to know <laughs> you're barely going to you won't even know what the goal is let alone how to get to the goal right yeah so uh find the bare minimum hacky way at first uh, to get it done get, and then get to the mvp get to the mvp exactly yeah. okay. uh and then but like once you do that you also it's like i don't know if you've played age of empires um, i have i i also uh, learned that you're a fan of age of empires 2 i believe yes yes oh my god love that game i remember when i was a child i tormented my brother by not letting him play age of empires <laughs> and just hogging the computer and playing that game forever and he hated me for it but uh so like in age of empires like you know you start with a little area and then slowly you discover the map and you only know where your characters are going and everything else is dark yeah and i think machinery is like that and the real world is definitely like that uh and you don't have to know the entire map to win the game you just have to discover enough things and build resources in the places that you do find so i would almost approach it like that and um eventually though if it depends on if you want to go into research or if you want to build Models for production. Uh, once you know enough of the map, then you should start uh, developing depth and reading all of the papers in that field. But you can't. You like literally can't read papers in all of the fields. So if you want to go into research, you pick your area and you read all the seminal papers from the beginning until now, and that's when you develop depth. And then if you're trying to do machine learning in production, maybe you go and learn about all of the tools that uh, you need. to put models into production and that's when you but don't develop depth before you know what the map looks like you know totally uh, so i also want to talk about what do you do uh, at work on non pandemic days that's that's my favorite question these <laughs> is can can you uh, walk us through a day in your life on non pandemic days non pandemic so before this happened uh, mm-hmm. okay cool uh, so 
I um, so I uh, live in SF um, and uh, I live by this uh, and there's context to this like uh, so I live by this really beautiful bay uh, where there's a really cool like market where there's like cheeses and breads and vines and fresh produce and oh my god so I start my mornings by getting uh, fresh produce from there and um, I think just having that half an hour to myself helps me set my intention for the day because uh, my job is quite insane because like you know if when you're the head of growth like there's so many things coming at you at all the time uh, and like if you don't go in with an intention you will uh, let other people run your day and your agenda and while doing that I know okay these are the three things I need to get done and then I go into our office our co-workers are amazing could not say um, make more nice things about them or our uh, CEO um, our CTO they're all amazing um, and um, we start with just meeting with the team uh, and figuring out what we want to do for uh, the day and then I guess it's just a bunch of meetings from 9 a.m. until like even like 4 um, and then uh, like uh, removing blockages. So this is not what a traditional machine learning engineer's day looks like at all. But if you're managing machine learning projects, this is what your day, I guess, would look like. Um, is, but uh, I meet with our authors who are working on really exciting machine learning problems um, and creating these beautiful reports, which maybe mm. we should put in the show notes. Uh, you should check them out. They're really cool. Um, so uh, meet with them to see what is blocking them and get them access to resources. Then um, I meet with um, our growth team um, on all of the different campaigns we're running. Um, we're doing AMAs with paper authors. Uh, so we have to reach out to more paper authors and get them excited about the AMA and uh, figure that stuff out. We're doing salons where uh, people come and give talks. So we're always looking for um, people to give, come give talks there. We just launched this paper project where the community can come and build on top of interesting papers. So there's always a number of projects that need stuff done. Uh, so we do that. Uh, and then just uh, talk to the inch team to figure out how we can improve the product from the feedback that we're hearing from the customers. And at 4 p.m., everyone else's day ends. So then my personal workday begins. And then I actually get into like some code or like whatever meat of the work uh, that I need to do. And then I'll, um, on non-pandemic days, I'll do that. Because <laughs> right now this goes on until I go to sleep. Uh, but before, in the happier times, this would end at seven. And then my friends and I just meet up, grab drinks, um, and uh, get dinner and talk about our days and how life is going and do fun things that 20-somethings do uh, and do it all over again. Um. I'm uh, I, so I also love the community aspect. Uh, Weights and biases is also doing a lot of things for the community. Uh, for people on the other side, I'm sure you've interacted with many people from the community. How should they? Uh, not not just limited to Weights and biases. There are many amazing events which I think uh, they should attend all of them. But for for someone, I, I think anyone can literally join literally any meetup. Uh, there's there's now no barrier across uh, the Bay Area people. Or How even cool people is that, anywhere. right? Anyone can join any meetup anywhere in the world. It's pretty cool. How should they uh, get the most out of it, in, in your opinion? Interesting question. Um, so specifically for like Zooms or? Uh, most of the meetups are on Zoom. Uh, basically any, any ML related meetup, uh, because I know you've hosted a bunch of uh, different flavors of them. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. So ask a lot of questions. Think about what your uh, what your intention is when you're going into these. Uh, one, it is obviously to learn stuff. But then another uh, intention is uh, to like build connections, network with people, um, and not uh, necessarily to pursue an end goal like you're trying to get a job or whatever. It's just uh, fun to like uh, be in conversations, uh, exciting machine learning conversations, and how you do that is by proving that you are someone they might want to talk to as well. And then fun opportunities come out of that, you know. Uh, so I would ask a lot of questions and like, uh, don't be afraid. Cause if you have that question, other people probably do as well. 
um, and the people in our events who ask a lot of questions, I'll often like reach out to them and like then I want to help them too because I'm like, oh, you made my event better. So think about what the event manager is looking for. Um, in general, uh, even beyond meetups, uh, in it's great to approach the world as, you know, if you as uh, like I feel like good people do this naturally, uh, but like what does the person that I'm interacting with want from this and how can I make them feel special? How can I make them, uh, this a good experience for them without any intention of like getting something back? Because then your experience will be so much richer in that uh, event or in that interaction. And then somehow good things will happen. So in the context of meetups, they want you to ask questions. They want you to engage in other ways or share interesting resources and prove that you're someone that the speakers want to hang out with. And then after that, you can be like, hey, your talk was really cool. Want to hang out, uh, do a quick call or whatever. I, I think there are three, three kinds of uh, introverts on Zoom. The first uh, ha- talks through the video. The second uh, has the video of just the audio. Third is uh, just chat. Please, please don't be uh, category two or three. Exactly. What, wait, what's the third one? The third one is who just type in chat. I guess there could also be a fourth category who types in private messages on Zoom. No, don't be that person. At all. <laughs> and I get how hard it is, you know, especially if you, you don't want to make a fool of yourself. Nobody does. But the bar to make a fool of yourself is very high in most um uh, social situation so what you do unless you're creepy don't be creepy don't do any of that kind of stuff but if you're just like a genuinely curious machinery person i don't think you can make a fool of yourself easily um uh, i know you're also hosting uh machine learning salon uh weekly uh, is it a weekly event bi-weekly yeah. bi-weekly gotcha. uh, can, can anyone reach out and present uh, what sort of yeah. uh, projects do you usually look for there uh, so there's a form, or you could just tweet at me. You don't have to go to the form, uh, but uh, just send me um, an example of something you've done. And the one thing is like you have to be kind of engaging. Um, mm. So if you have examples of uh, talks you've given, if you have something interesting to say and you have an engaging way to say it, I am totally down for you to come and give a talk. So just DM me on Twitter and we'll make it happen. I think that's that's also a fascinating way. Uh, I guess it's it's called uh, the technical term is networking, but it's really meeting people uh, who who share the interest. Uh, if if you're a presenter, that's that's the best scenario because everyone will come and uh, talk to you. Yeah, and uh, honestly, everyone has something to say, so don't be scared. You know, just yeah. Absolutely. I also want to touch upon uh, what is weights and biases and uh, why is it important, uh, this this problem that you are solving important enough that you had to go out and create a company. How how big of a challenge is it? Oh, it's not my company. I'm just like... Uh, head yes. Of- I mean, but, uh, but weights and biases have to establish itself in, in that context. Totally. Uh, uh, so uh, let's think about what the world without weights and biases looks like. Actually, let me tell you guys what we do first. So... that's like a car engine we let you pick up the hood and look under the hood of your model and see what's going on um and specifically what we do is uh before weights and biases you would train a model you would maybe note down the hyperparameters in a google sheet or like with pen and paper and then you would train a bunch of models and the moment you have enough models you might uh, you could save that performance as like screenshots of the loss curves or whatever but then it's hard to uh, like compare the performance. You can't zoom into the graphs, look at all of them together, or uh, you can't see what predictions your models are making. So if you're training more than 10 models, it gets crazy really fast. And I'm almost so surprised by how many people are doing this in production where their machine learning engineers are not tracking experiments. It's like writing code without GitHub. Like, what are you doing? Uh, don't do that. Uh, and with weights and biases, you can just say, with three lines of code, um, you can just log all of the metrics um, and the hyperparameters. Uh, and maybe you can put the link. I wish I could show you the picture of what this looks like. Um, maybe we can put it in the show notes. It'll be there. 
Cool. Uh, but uh, now you have a list of all of the models, all of the hyperparameters you tried, all, uh, all of the performance uh, graphs, and then you can be like, oh, I wonder how uh, changing the batch size or the learning rate affected my uh, model. Uh, and then you can just boom, 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 filter to all the different learning rates and then see all of the graphs together. Uh, you can also do hyperparameter sweeps, which is our hyperparameter optimization product. Um, and there, uh, all you have to do is you define the different parameters you want to try as a dictionary or a YAML file. And then you say what search strategy you want. So grid, base, random. And then you just, uh, 1db.agent, uh, you do that and it starts running a bunch of models. Um, and then it finds you the best model and creates these beautiful hyperparameter, um, like, you know, um, uh, like parallel coordinates plot where you can see- Like a tensor board uh, plot? Uh, I don't know. Uh, TensorFlow might have other plots specifically. This is like the parallel coordinates. So okay. you have for each hyperparameter, there's like a column and there's lines going through each, you know, and then the, your metric is at the end. Gotcha. So you can, so, yeah. um, but the other thing that we do is um, I was so happy to work on this feature. I built this parameter importance plot where you can pick the metric you care about, so like your loss. And then it'll train a random forest on all of your hyperparameters and the values of your metric. Um, and it'll show you which hyperparameter was the most important in predicting this value and which one was the most correlated. So suddenly you can train a bunch of models and then just with one click add this plot and see, okay, my learning rate, um, these values of my learning rate were the most effective in reducing my loss. Or if you get into more interesting things like, these augmentation techniques were most interesting, you know, things that are not obvious. Um, and all of this is like just a few lines of code. The other thing people love is you can track uh, the GPU metrics and like the system resource usage. Um, and none of us have OpenAI's amazing compute resources. So we're all pretty resource constrained. So you can see which types of models did were the most uh, resource efficient. Um, other things we just, launched artifacts, which lets you not just track your model um, and the model training life cycle, but also data sets. So you can suddenly combine three different data sets uh, and some wrangling scripts, put a model here, and then maybe it spits out another data set, which you then wrangle. And like, you know, you can build actual machine learning pipelines using artifacts. And then the last thing, <laughs> Uh, is sorry. Uh, this I mean I find this really exciting. Um, so the last thing is reports, which we are the most excited about. Uh, at least I am because uh, reports let you uh, show what you're doing with your model in a very exciting way. So essentially, reports are like you put markdown and then you put your model predictions and then also your model metrics in one blog post, but that comes alive. It's like distilled up pub uh, blog post that anyone can make. Uh, gotcha. Yeah, so uh, that we're very excited about because we've been working with a lot of paper authors and they just find that a more exciting medium to get people engaged with their research than other mediums. Definitely. Uh, you, you mentioned all of these amazing features. Uh, how much of an effort is it to uh, use these? How much of changes to my current pipeline would I have to make uh, to involve these? That's a great question. Uh, so we try to keep it under five lines, uh, depending on the framework, it's anywhere between three and five lines of code. So essentially you just import one DB, you initialize a project. And then um, if you, uh, the framework agnostic way to do it is just one DB log and then the mm -hmm. dictionary of the uh, metrics. If you have Keras, you can just put a 1db callback in your fit function and PyTorch. But you just add 1db.watch. So basically one line of code and then it just picks up everything, creates these uh, beautiful plots. And also one thing I didn't touch upon, it stores it forever or as long as you want it to be. So you can go back and see what you did two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Gotcha. Uh but what's uh, one maybe underrated aspect of tracking uh, experiments that uh, you think you, you've realized after after working on these projects for a while? Interesting. Uh, I think uh, the underrated aspect is the experiment tracking itself. And I'll tell you a story for why I think that, because I think we're still early in uh, our uh, 
like life as a machine learning community and the profession is very young. So for example, um, we had, I won't name the person, but one of our users, uh, they were, um, one of the team members had just put uh, weights and biases um, in the model. So they were logging all of their model metrics without everyone being like looking, uh, going to their weights and biases dashboards and like looking at them all the time. But like they were logging their models and the performance and weights and biases. Now, two days before their paper deadline, with three epochs of training left, they lose access to their compute resources and suddenly oh, no. they're like, what? Exactly. And then, then, uh, and they have a panic attack because, like, you know, uh, they've been working on this for weeks. And then someone realizes, oh, we stored the models, the weights, the architecture, and the performance in weights and biases. So then they were able to go back and just rebuild the model and, like, train. And that person was like, I didn't get it till it broke. So it's like insurance. You don't realize you need it till you have it. It's Essentially, it's, it's like a GitHub for machine learning, uh, like very specific to machine learning. Uh. Exactly. Uh, yeah, in that you can also st uh, store your model versions, but then you can also get all this telemetry. Uh, like NASA wouldn't send rockets to space without having enough instrumentation and seeing what changing everything does to the rocket. So why would you build models, you know, without tracking what they do? That's a great analogy. So I usually try to end uh, these interviews with, a, with two questions. The first one uh, is, is the same repeat question, which is what would be your best advice to someone who's uh, just starting their journey in machine learning, broadly speaking? Yeah, uh, interesting. Um, don't be afraid to get started. Um, the barriers that, why don't people start, like, if you think about it, right? If I'm just a normal person who, hasn't, who has maybe coded or never coded, but is it, is excited about machine learning. And this applies to a lot more girls than boys, maybe, or maybe not. Like uh, the barriers you think exist don't actually exist. Nobody in the real world actually knows what they're doing. Maybe there's like two people in the world who know what they're doing. Everyone else is just figuring it out. So you are as good a person to write the next great paper or invent the next great tool as anyone else. Uh, so knowing that, um, just uh, follow your curiosity, find an exciting problem that nobody else is working on. Because now that you are determined to start, um, uh, the next goal is to get people's attention and to prove that you can actually do something to engage with the rest of the community, whether that's as a job or to get into a good school or to get collaborators to work on an exciting project. Um, and how you do that is by working on something nobody else is um, and like, you know, growth hack yourself, like pick projects that people will find exciting um, and then try a bunch of stuff. Um, I think Alex um, from Facebook had this like beautiful code that was like so powerful. Uh, he was talking about why the Facebook growth team succeeded when other people didn't. And he said, it's not because we were the smartest. It's not because, uh, you know, we had done it before. There were people who had been doing it a lot more. They just um, were dogged in the amount of experiments they ran and tried, mm -hmm. and they had no ego. So they were like, okay, I tried this, didn't work. No problem. Uh, try this, no problem. So, you know, just keep doing that. And if you can increase your iteration speed of learning, then eventually you'll get to your gradient descent here, just to, not yeah. to me, your gradient descent your way into being a great machine learning engineer. Totally. Uh, the final question I usually try to end on a fun one. Uh, can you tell us about the two uh, doggos on the team? And <laughs> I'll, I'll make you pick one, which one would be oh your choice. God, oh, they're going to kill me. Uh, so. We have our chief morale officer, who's Mo. Mo is our CTO's dog, um, and he's so cute. Very different personality. And then the other one is Chica, who is my friend Nick's uh, dog. Uh, and she is a fireball, like, oh my <laughs> god. Uh, so she is an illegal immigrant from Mexico, okay. technically, because she was exported uh, or like as in like she was brought across the border without having paper uh, maybe allegedly um and they didn't care but like yeah so she's had a fun life so i think i would pick her gotcha before we end the interview can you mention uh, all of the platforms where the audience can find you and connect with you uh, keep up to date on yeah. what, what you're up to uh, 
so I think Twitter is the biggest one, and you can follow me at uh, Levania AI. Um, and please say hi. Uh, if you're working on something interesting, let me know. I I will love to feature you. Uh, on rates and biases, the other places uh, you can find us is our Slack community, which we'll also leave in uh, the description below, because um, that's where you can find all of these different places that you can start engaging. So uh, anyone who in your audience who's in the beginning stages of the career or even working on interesting things, but in the uh, but in India and wants access to this network, that's what you'll find in our Slack community, and you can uh, give talks and they can, you know tap into that network. Awesome. Uh, Lavanya, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast and sharing your journey and all of these great advices for everyone. Thank you for having me. This is a lot of fun. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give it a review or feel free to shoot me a message. You can find all of the social media links in the description. If you like the show, please subscribe and tune in each week to Chai Time Data Science.